Um, and it's, uh, I first met Michael in uh, Miami at a big old show at a hotel there. And uh, we became very quick friends and we've kept up uh, over the last couple of years. So he's really new in my life and I'm very fortunate to know him. He's an incredibly talented artist, oh, um, designer, prolific and very, very busy. Um, <laughs> Very, very busy. Um, so I'm going to let Michael go right into it. Um, he is going to be speaking specifically regarding his experience as an artist, but also in fashion today um, as a designer. So uh, all the things you want to know. Um, and we will start. Hi, Michael. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Um, let me see. Can I screen share? Can I show you guys a little presentation? Yes, you should be able to. Let me see. I'm trying to click. I've got two screens on right now, and so it's all chaotic. Um, let me see. Let's do this window. And then we'll switch to my little artist talk. Great. We can see what you're looking at. No problem. Little view, slideshow. Can we see all this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Wait, it says paused. Oh. Can you see what I'm doing? No, it just says loading. Why don't you reload? A oh, resume share. I don't know what happened. Stop share. Let me try again. Let me try again. Okay. I think okay. it was, I hit the, um, the like full screen thing on this like artist talk thing. Exit full screen. Okay. We can see your Google Slides now. No problem. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I was trying to make it big, but we're just gonna click through this part. You can you get a preview and all the stuff over there. Sounds good. Okay, cool. So hi y'all. How's it going? Great. Um, my name is Michael Birch Pierce. Um, I'm pronouns are they and them. I teach at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I teach in fashion design and merchandising. Um I have a long career in both fashion and fine art. Um, uh, fashion was my first love, and now I'm more of a fine artist, but I still kind of work with one foot in the fashion world, one foot in the fine art world. So I kind of bounce back and forth. Um, and Melissa asked me to come speak to you guys about my career and what I do, um, answer a bunch of questions. Um, so this class, we're, we're kind of like talking about, um, career options and, and things that we can do. Is that right? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, fashion's great. Do fashion. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through this little, it's kind of my like artist talk that I usually give when I'm like coming in as like a visiting artist. So it might have some superfluous things that are less career focused and more just like these are sparkly things that I make and aren't they cool? So we can click through some of that stuff a little quicker um, and then just talk about the career stuff a little separately. Um, but here we go. Um, this is my artist statement. I don't, we don't need to read that. Well, we can read it. <laughs> Um, so I am a, a textile artist primarily. All my work is based in embroidery. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trained in couture textiles. Um, I've got my master's degree from Savannah College of Art and Design and my undergrad in fashion from uh, VCU. Uh, but my statement says, an artifice is not simply made. It is meticulously crafted through a lifetime of careful, careful decisions. My work is an intimate study of the self we choose to share and the authenticity of interaction. Oop, let me accidentally click through slides. Um, couched in the superficiality of high fashion, I use traditional embroidery techniques to elevate cheap and gaudy materials into precious tenuous structures. Each piece has a personality and through hours of obsessive stitching, I construct its identity. Oop, I keep clicking on it. They exist in layers that demand an intimate relationship with the viewer, concealing and revealing amalgams of plastic and purities of light and space. So basically, my artwork is about artificiality. It's about the um, the self that we kind of build um, using um, the artifices that we that we put on our bodies and our lives, and, and the clothes that we wear, and the way we do our hair, and how we present ourselves, and how 
how do we form our own identities superficially and how are they connected to um, who we actually are deep down inside of us. Um, this is where I talk about my inspirations. David Bowie, Spice Girls, RuPaul. You can probably also throw in Dolly Parton and Joan Rivers in there. And you got a real solid group of the people that like uh, determine who I am as a person and an artist and a designer. Um, so this, I forgot that this was in here. This is some of my work from undergrad from 20 years ago when I was at VCU. Very dated, very stupid. Um, this is a, a series of um, my senior collection. I designed all of my own digital textile prints and, and printed all of my own fabric, made these dresses, collaborated with a jewelry designer to make these sort of ridiculous pieces that, um, that paired with the dresses. Um, and this one was kind of like the sh uh, the big piece in the collection. Now I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, what the hell was I making in 2003? But um, whatever, it got me to where I am today. Um, I, I always planned to be a, a women's wear designer. That was always my goal in life was to, um, I don't know, I just love, I love dresses. I love pretty cotton day dresses, uh, sometimes beautiful silk evening gowns. It was always my goal was to go out and work in that industry. Um, and so I got this degree from VCU and then immediately got a job designing the ugliest menswear humanly possible. Um, was the best job I could find. And so I worked for this company called J6. We had, a, this was a brand called V-Lux that we had. And then uh, this was 2007. Um, and so it was the height of like Jersey Shore affliction t-shirts, um, where which are like those ones with like the, I don't know, like the Gothic lettering and the like, spray paint designs and like the the studs like glued onto the t-shirts you guys are all probably way too young to remember that i think they're actually coming back in style now like ed hardy was really big back then too and so this company was like knocking off those t-shirts um and then i was designing like men's dress shirts that were on a more like high-end level um these were very similar if you've watched the show modern family if you know the shirts that uncle cam wears where it's like uh, two different patterns like he turns up the cuff and it's like a crazy contrasting pattern they were very big in 2007 2008 and so that is what i designed basically and in menswear you really there's not a lot to do <laughs> really you can't really reinvent the wheel now i think designers get to be a lot more um adventurous with menswear but back then like it was uh, you just had to give them different fabric each season, but it was the same shirt. So I became really a textile designer after having done in, in, in my senior year, just some dumb, easy textile designs there. I really got thrown into it and was designing prints and repeats and weave structures and knit things and, and crazy t-shirt patterns. Um, so from there, I... I don't know, we had a, a economic collapse in 2008 that was really fun and everybody lost their jobs. <laughs> this company went out of business, I think in 2009. Um, and so I waited tables uh, in New York for a while and then in, back in Virginia when New York got to be too expensive. Um, then I went to grad school. And so I decided to go to, um, to SCAD for grad school. Um, because I was like, let me go to school for a little while longer. Let me wait out this, this recession and see if when the recession's over, if more people are hiring and if I can re-enter the workforce with more skills doing what I actually want to do. Um, Cause I think I realized I didn't really want to make clothes anymore. I was really interested in the textiles. I was interested in these um, repeat designs instead. Um, so I went to grad school, I went to SCAD down in Savannah and got my degree in, um, in fibers, um, went fully intending to focus entirely on print design, started in print design my very first semester there. Um, and then, uh, somehow like I had taken like one, like 
four week embroidery class in undergrad and somehow all of my work turned into embroidery in grad school. Um, so within my first uh, quarter there at SCAD, I was tapped to embroider uh, the Christmas tree decorations for the Obama White House in 2010 for the Blue Room Christmas tree. And then from there, it kind of like exploded off into other directions. And so I um, took a break from grad school halfway through and took an internship with Diane von Furstenberg, um, who at the time was the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. She's a former German princess and socialite turned fashion designer. She invented the wrap dress in the 70s. Um, and so I uh, started interning in their print department and then was quickly stolen by their embellishment department um, and then hired for a while um, before I left to go finish my degree. Um, and so here's a piece that I developed there at Diane von Furstenberg where um, I would do, I would embroider tiny little clusters of sequins and rhinestones and Swarovski crystals um, and then sort of photocopy them a million times uh, and then tape them all together and kind of design what would this look like as like a full repeat pattern that could fill fabric, could cover a garment. And so then this is that garment that I was designing here. And this is on Solange in Nylon Magazine um, in 2012. Uh, God, I can't believe 2012, so long ago. I'm so old. Um, this here is, um, I don't know if I can zoom in. Ooh, no. Um, this here was more work that I designed in that first collection, a DVF that I worked on. I worked on a few more after that, but this one was the one that I was really in love with. It was just spring 12. Um, and so I, I developed all of these embroideries that went onto these garments. This was like these crazy plastic and silk and Swarovski crystal flowers around the neck of this dress. Uh, this was all lace and hand stitching and plastic petals. That was that one I just showed you on Solange. Um, it was really cool to then see this one here ended up on Shalom Harlow in, the, uh, in Vogue uh, in a crazy spread with Amber Valletta. And you guys don't know who they are, but they're two of the best supermodels of the 90s. And I lost my mind when I saw them on them. Um, so I got back to SCAD, finished my master's. Um, and sort of just veered straight into embroidery and embellishment. And that is um, kind of what's guided my entire career since then. Um, so here's a piece that I designed where I I laser cut um, all of these cotton sequins that this dress is 100% cotton, except for like the beads that hold it, the, the sequins on and the metal zipper that's on the side of it. Other than that, every single piece of it is 100% cotton. I invented these sequins that are 100% um, biodegradable, machine washable, dyeable. Um, they're really fun. Um, this was a collection that I did for, this is my senior, or not my senior, my master's thesis. Um, I designed these garments that were meant to be sort of um, abstracted portraits of the wearers that I was, I was researching a lot of artificiality in, fa in fashion that I was talking about before. And I was researching a lot about identity. Um, and so I was looking at the clothes that people wear. What is like your favorite garment that you wear every day? I was looking at, I was looking at wedding gowns that cost like thousands of dollars and are completely impersonal and don't actually say anything about you as a person. So instead I made sure that all of the embroidery on these garments um, contain symbols and icons, these laser cut sequins and, and different patterns and some portraits so that everything told a story and had um, all of these memories tied to them. So uh, like this one right here, this, this woman was going through a divorce and her mom died and she was trying to uh, quit smoking and drinking at the same time. And, um, and this dress is covered with cigarettes and snakes and dildos and eyeballs and all sorts of um, crazy things that were like telling the story about her. And so these artificial things, these sparkly, glamorous garments, um, instead are telling these very real, raw memories of their lives. This wedding gown, every sequin stitched into here told a different story from her relationship with her husband, um, including all of the bad 
bad memories and, and had like their fights as well as their first meetings, their proposals, as well as their, you know, health battles and all of that stuff was built into that gown that she actually wore on her wedding day. Um, and then that sort of veered into sort of installation art. And so I started taking those sequins and blowing up them up really huge um, and, and making these sort of spaces out of them. So this contains all of these different memories from all those people. So in this yoga studio that SCAD purchased it to put in their yoga studio, I did keep some of those dildo sequins in there and didn't tell them. They were like, please remove them. And I said, nope. Um, here's some other installation works that I did. So I started veering into, um, started veering into fine art from that point, just because I got a weird opportunity to kind of work with SCAD and design their spaces and um, design some crazy installations. Uh, the point of my thesis was always to go back into the fashion industry. I had job offers at Marc Jacobs and Ralph Rucci to go back to New York and do all of that. Um, but all of a sudden I was offered a job working with Andre Leon Talley. Um, Andre Leon Talley, uh, you might have heard of him. He just passed away last year. He was uh, a Vogue editor. He had like cameo in the Sex and the City movie. He was a guest judge on, or not a guest judge, a whole season, like regular judge for a couple seasons on Top Model. Um, he's a, he's like the six foot seven black man who's like 400 pounds and like really sassy and rude and wears giant like caftans and capes all the time. Uh, he was my boss and I worked on, uh, these, uh, couture museum exhibitions with him and I was his lead stylist. Um, and so, uh, this is an installation of our show, Little Black Dress, uh, that I got to go to Paris for Couture Fashion Week in 2013 and install the show. Um, found out five minutes before I had to give it that I was supposed to give Anna Wintour a tour of the exhibition um, at 8 a.m. Uh, on a day where I wasn't even supposed to be in the museum. Um, and so I had to give the editor of Vogue, who's the basis for Devil Wears Prada, Miranda Priestley, uh, had to walk her through this whole exhibition and show everything. And then she pointed out all the things that we should change before we opened that night. And so I had to spend the whole day where I was supposed to have the day off changing everything. But um, that was a really cool experience. I worked on multiple exhibitions with them, kind of flew all over the world. He was a really close friend. Um, and he, it kind of like opened the door for me to do anything that I want. He, you know, like he emailed Mark Jacobs personally and said, hey, you should hire this person. Uh, let's Let's do some work together. You know, he introduced me to Vera Wang and Ricardo Tishi and Mary Koch and Zhu and lots of my favorite designers. Um, from there though, I had this, uh, after I started getting people reaching out about uh, art exhibitions. And so I started showing in galleries and museums and I kind of never went back to fashion in, in a full-time way um, because I started recontextualizing the language and vernacular of fashion and embellishment to um, these sort of abstract portraits and sort of like building these personalities and building these um, different structures. And they became sort of all about having intimate moments with artificial objects. Um, they started like this, this was a series that was like told a whole poem and everything that was meant to kind of uh, pull the viewer in to give you a diffracted portrait, like a um, uh, reflection of yourself where you couldn't see that you would only see the chaos of the embellishment on top of it. Um, I got to do artist residencies. I did this artist residency in Hong Kong um, and worked on this crazy sculpture of an elephant that was auctioned off at Sotheby's for, for charity for many thousands of dollars. It was very exciting. Um, this is from a residency I did in the south of France. I got to go teach at um, Savannah College of Art and Design in Lacoste in Provence and, and got to just be inspired by the, the culture and the landscape and the uh, textiles there and, and build these things and build my career. From that point, um, and, and uh, VCU hired me on to start teaching there as an adjunct professor. So I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, and now I'm a full-time professor there, but these are more of the works that I started doing. I started mixing figurative work with the abstract work 
um, it started becoming about uh, gender and about my sexuality. It started becoming about um, dis depicting these figures that were both strong and vulnerable, that were both soft and hard, um, kind of like really looking at uh, who I am and how I move and and what my identity is and how do I how do I build an artifice and what's real and what's fake and this work ended up um, informing my identity uh, coming out as non-binary that um, I was kind of exploring both sides of my gender and then realizing that none of them are were the correct side <laughs> Um, and so these are a lot of the works that I made that were meant to be kind of self-portraits in, in abstraction, in, in fur and rhinestones that I, uh, I'm a lifelong vegetarian, but realized that at a certain point, if I was talking about uh, the things that I'm putting on my body, the, the way that I'm portraying myself, um, that I needed to start using this, this flesh and this fur um, to kind of reference um, my own skin. Um, apart from that, I developed this um, practice that Melissa knows well uh, that I did in, in Miami when, when we met. Um, this was developed in graduate school. Uh, this, I wonder, does this actually play the video? I think it's broken, it's just a photo. Um, but I developed this practice that was just kind of messing around in the studio back in 2011, um, where I stitched portraits of people with my sewing machine. Um, and so I, basically I sit there at the sewing machine, I look at you and in three to five minutes while you're sitting in front of me, I move the fabric under the sewing machine to draw a picture of you in real time. Um, and it started as just something cool that I was doing to, to kind of like another mark making technique within my studio. And then people realized that it was actually really exciting as a performance and to engage people. Um, and so people started hiring me, like Ellie Tahari in Manhattan hired me to come to their flagship store and just stitch portraits of their customers. And so they'd pay me $500 and I'd stitch portraits all night. Andre Leontali put me on his Instagram doing his portrait. Um, but then bigger companies started discovering me and I started doing bigger gigs. So this is my first Art Basel doing portraits like at the actual Art Basel uh, um, Design Miami show um, in Miami in 2015. This was doing portraits for American Greetings. And I just realized this is the 2017 version of this talk. So there's a bunch of other stuff I've done since then. Um, but now I travel all over the world. And this is my my main job before I just took this full time position at VCU teaching fashion design. Um, but I've gone to the Oscars, the Super Bowl, South by Southwest, uh, music festivals in Portugal, artist residencies in Hong Kong. Um, what else? I think we went back to the Super Bowl in February, potentially. Um, just I've done portraits for Shaquille O'Neal, John Malkovich, Helen Mirren. Um, just did Keanu Reeves, but I signed an NDA, so you did not hear that. Um, and so my job is to like fly all over the place and do these portraits. And now I get paid way more than $500 a night, um, like more than 10 times that now. Um, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. And it allows me to connect to a lot of people and do really cool things. Oh God, so this is all old work. I don't even have the new stuff to show you, but there's new work. Um, that actually, while we're on here, I'll just pull it up and just Google myself. Um, a couple of years ago at uh, Art Gazel, the show that uh, we do in Miami every year, um, that's where I met Melissa. I sold a piece of my artwork to this guy who's like the um, head of global marketing for Levi's apparently. And he loved it so much and he showed it to his team. And then Levi's reached out and during the pandemic when everything was closed and everything was over and um, everything was terrible, they asked me to do a custom collection of couture um, uh, vintage jackets for them. And so I embroidered these figures uh, using my uh, couture embroidery techniques. Um, this is, the figures is, is done with a technique 
called Irish machine embroidery that where instead of programming it to a machine and allowing the machine to kind of stitch what I've drawn, I instead um, draw this completely freehand with a sewing machine and sort of like paint with different layers of thread. Um, and then I went and hand stitched all of these. It's not loading everything properly, but hand stitched all the crystals and did this limited edition collection for them. Um, I don't know what else I did. Sorry, the, that presentation wasn't finished. <laughs> That's an old one. But I think no, it gets into like what I do in fashion. And so now I teach students how to make things. So I teach, um, I teach courses in couture embroidery, which is like my main thing that all my students love to, to get into or are always fighting to get into that class. Um, I also teach dressmaking, tailoring, cut and sew knitwear, um, repeat textile print design. And um, I teach a course on gender nonconforming fashion where we specifically design for trans and gender nonconforming people in that course. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah. I'm going to open it up. I, I, we may have some questions in the room. I'm going to open it up to them, but then I have, um, you know, I have a slew of questions to, yeah, you've got a nice list. I do guys. Do you have any questions before I, uh, throw them out? All right, they're gonna deviate a little bit from our script if that's okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm down for whatever. So what do you think people's misconceptions are about fashion design? Ooh, misconceptions. Well, I think that, um, and I think it goes into a lot of my research about art artificiality, right? And about um, superficiality of fashion is that people think that fashion is uh, vapid or that it, it has no substance to it, that fashion, um, is just uh, superficial and and vain and narcissistic to be engaged in it. But fashion is, um, I think it's the second largest industry in the world. I think uh, fashion is something that every single person has a connection to. Um, you know, there's a the famous uh, monologue in Devil Wears Prada where, um, uh, where what's her name Meryl Streep <laughs> just like reads Anne Hathaway's character for filth saying you think that you've exempted yourself from fashion because you choose whatever this is but we choose it for you um which is true that that fashion trends and everything that we're wearing everything that we're interested in works on a cycle that everything that all, all of our college students are wearing today are exactly what I wore 20 years ago when I was their age um, just with a twist to it. Um, I think that, uh, but I, I think more than that, I, I think that there are, there are deep sociological and anthropological reasons why we wear fashion, like why we wear clothes. Um, the, the, we wear clothes for protection, for modesty, um, but also as a form of nonverbal communication between ourselves and the people around us that we communicate, um, uh, uh, our own identity through the clothes that we put on ourselves. So, so they're very important that, um, that we traditionally, like uh, anthropologically speaking, thinking about tribes that, you know, they identify like who you are and where you stand within a tribe um, and, and um, identify yourself to other people within your group and in uh, outsider groups. And we do the same thing with our clothes that, you know, when a punk rock person wears their, leather jackets with their metal studs and everything. They're communicating to other people within that community that they are like-minded and connected. Um, they are communicating to people outside of their community, not to fuck with me because I am a badass, right? You know, you're communicating if you put it on as a costume, a desire to align yourself with that group um, or, or we can, um, yeah, we can infer all sorts of things about people with the clothes that they wear, and they don't all have to be completely superficial. Um, I think a lot of those are actually very deeply connected to like who we are and what we're about and what our identity is. I think that as people, we collect so many things. We think about our homes and our apartments or dorm rooms um, and how we design them to like really express ourselves and our individuality. But the things that we own, the only objects that we um that we possess, that we take with us and have intimately connected to our bodies all day long are, well, I mean, our, our cell phones, but also uh, 
but also our clothes. And so that's how you bring everything that you've built to um, sort of define yourself by the things you've collected. That's how, what you bring out to the world and that's how you communicate to other people. Um, so I don't think it's, I don't think it's vapid at all. I think it's really, I think it's really beautiful. And that's, that's what informs everything that I do is, okay. is those sort of thoughts. Yep. Well, and I think you were, you and I have a link that is kind of similar. I'm not trying to insert myself here, but I just yeah, realized it. You and I recurate things to ultimately exemplify our values and our own identities. Yeah. It's a complex mix, right? We're pulling from all kinds of things in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So you're now like, you're an academic, yes. right? You, work, you worked in industry and now you're, now you're in academia and who knows yeah. what the next step is beyond that. But so what do you think that, um, what do you think that academia doesn't know that the industry actually does? Ooh. Or what do you think that we heavily talk about or don't talk about? that the industry does? Um, I mean, I think sometimes academia, I don't know. Oh, you know what one thing I think is like, people always say in academia, well, you're gonna get out into the real world and no one's gonna give you extensions on anything. You gotta turn your work in on time. That's a lie. People give you extensions all the time in the real world. Um, but also, I mean, in fashion, there's a lot of things that are like really hard deadlines. And if you miss it, the, the collection doesn't get produced in time and you're screwed. So there, there's some things that are hard and fast. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I think in academia, everything's theoretical. And so as much as you can learn in college, as much as you can like try to practice what you think things are going to be like in the real world, everything is a simulation in the classroom and nothing is real. Um, it's very real to you and the work that you're producing, but when you get out to the real world, um, everything's different, you know, and there's certain rules and standards for the ways that we make things and we produce things and we, you know, all of our, our technical patterns have to look a certain way in our fashion department, but then you get into the real world and you're going to work at a company that makes them completely different. You're going to have to learn how to work with those standards. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell my students that you're going to learn way more in like six months on the job, like hands-on in the industry than you're actually gonna learn in the classroom um, because none of this is real in the classroom. We're just trying to give you the groundwork so that you go in there kind of knowing what you're doing, right? Yeah. So, um, well, I'm, and my next question is kind of like twofold. So if you were to give yourself your younger self advice, what would it be? And then unsolicited advice that isn't necessarily about youth. That's about being an artist, being creative, like yeah. back where we make and respond to the world. Like, what would that be? So if I had to, if I did tell my younger self something, mm -hmm. what would that be? Something about my career. Um, I don't know. My younger self really had it together. My younger self was great. What is what does together look like then for you? Like, I don't know. Um, are you kidding? <laughs> I kind of. I wasn't. I was not all together. Um, I think I would have told myself to take more chances. I think there was a lot of things that I. Um, I grew up in a family where my dad is a stockbroker and a wealth manager, and is very like linear and very. Um, uh, very like uh, academic he, he he's not creative in any way <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't understand anything outside of the business world and so he kind of like pushed me to like get solid jobs that were like safe and reliable he like pushed me to make decisions that um you know that were uh, that were sure bets and I think I didn't take enough chances when I was young and I could really do whatever I want. And when I had a safety net to like fall back on, that I had a daddy to help me if something happened, um, I think he like terrified me that every decision I had to make uh, had to be the right one. And so I, I think that one, one of the coolest things I see my students doing is, is just like, you know, just dropping everything and like, you know, moving to Berlin to just go work at some, 
random indie brand that they, you know, messaged on Instagram about and just said, okay, we're going to just spend all the money that we had. We're going to live in a hostel and just be poor and just go do this. And I'm just like, that's cool. I like, I can't do that anymore. I'm old. I've got a mortgage. I've got a dog. I've got like responsibilities. I've got taxes to pay. I've got a business to run. Um, so I can't like really do those crazy things anymore. Um, what I tell students all the time, the, unsol the unsolicited advice, and also whenever it's actually solicited, whenever somebody asks me for real, um, what the most important thing is they need to know going out into the world and in the industry is that you got to learn how to talk to people. Um, and I think a lot of our students now are, you know, like COVID kind of ruined us that, you know, we've spent so much time on Zoom and we've, you know, uh, spent so much time like not being in front of people. Um, I've gotten almost everything I've gotten in my life because I'm good at having conversations with people, because I can go to an art opening, because I can go to a cocktail party, because I can go to a fashion show, I can talk to a complete stranger, make a connection, um, talk about my work in a way that doesn't sound like I'm a conceited asshole, like desperate for a job, but just kind of like, yeah, this is what I do. And this is what's cool. You know, being generally interested about them, forming a connection, uh, keeping a relationship after that point via Instagram DM or email or whatever, that it's those connections that have gotten me almost everything that I've gotten in life. It's not my portfolio. I mean, I like to think that my art is pretty I mean I don't like to think it I think my art's kind of mediocre I think my designs are fine there are so many other artists out in the world who do stuff that blow my mind that I could never do and so I don't know maybe I'm my own worst critic but um I don't think I'm that much better than people who haven't gotten these opportunities I but I I know that I'm better than people at um and making connections and building relationships so you've got to like learn how to talk to people you've got to learn how to get out of your shell because nobody wants to hire somebody. Nobody wants to work with somebody. Nobody wants to collect from somebody who they like can't have a conversation with. That who they they don't like. You can, you're not going to get a job from somebody who like you know goes. You go into an interview and everything's brilliant and your work is great, but you just seem like you're miserable to spend all day every day with for the next you know you know forty hours a week for however, however long, right? Like you got to be somebody that people want to be around, right? So what do you find yourself repeating a lot in class? What's your mantra? My mantra? Oh, the thing that I say the most is, does that make sense? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm just like, God, like uh, I, I'm talking to you. I'm trying to convey information to you. And you guys are just looking at me completely with a blank uh, stare on your face. And I'm just like, I need, I need confirmation. Does that make sense? Did that get through? And if it didn't, how do I explain it better? How can I get you there instead? Um, I don't know, I've been in fashion, like a fashion mantra or like a design or an art mantra. I don't know that I have one. I don't know. I just tell them to put more rhinestones on it. I'm just like, what more can we do? Like, how can we make this more special? I think that there's a lot of people, a lot of students or a lot of designers that are just trying to like get by and like get through. And so like, it's a lot of what I do is trying to find a balance of like, how can we make this special? How can we make this you? How can you tell us something that no one's ever told us before? Rather than just regurgitating something that you saw Doja Cat wear and you want to make something that's in that vein. Like, who are you as a designer instead? Um, but then at the same time, I'm also always having to rein artists in who want to design things or make things that are beyond their actual skill level or the the amount of time and resources that they have at the moment. Um, so I need to be like, okay, how can we like get the job done and get the grade and move on with our lives uh, without, um, without just like completely destroying ourselves in the process? Like right. what's the balance between making something that's really special and very us and being very realistic about the time and the resources that we have. Uh, Ira Glass has this talk that's been snipped and put on YouTube a million times. Oh, I love it. Where I know exactly talk, which one you're talking about, like you, on creativity and- uh, Yes. And you get into the business, you get into art because you know, because uh, you have really good taste, right? Right. And, and but right, everything, you hate everything you're doing right now because you're, your skill hasn't 
met your level of taste yet. But if you keep exactly. up, then eventually your skill will match your taste. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So for all my students every year. Uh, man, yeah. Um, my big, so, oh, all right. So I'll end on this. Um, well, you've done a lot. You've done a lot. Like I'm blown away. It's um, fun. <laughs> yeah, you've done a lot and you're prolific and you don't seem to be slowing down and you're really responsive to, you know, in all honesty, it seems, and I know that inspiration is like a dirty word, but it seems like you follow that, that loose thread very faithfully. Um, yeah. And not a lot of people do, you know, a lot of people are sort of wrote about it. Right. So I'm curious, like, what have you not done yet that you'd kind of dream about? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'd like to do more like collaborations with more high-end designers, I guess. Like the Levi's thing was really cool. I want to do that with more people. I want to kind of be brought in as a guest designer on a collection here and there. I don't think I ever want to be like back in the industry, like having to um, hustle my own designs and run my own company and do that stuff anymore. I just want to, oh, I also want to do Oprah's portrait. I think that would be fun. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd like to kind of like continue making my art. I'd like to um, have just bigger and better exhibitions and, and get, um, get to the point where I can like hire studio assistants to just like make more stuff. Like all that work behind me, all of that stuff. Like I think the biggest piece back there is 20 inches across. I'm just like, that. I, I need to go bigger but my yeah. tiny little fingers and the tiny little beads only go so far so um I just want to do more I just want to get bigger and then as I do that I'd like to I'd like to do more collaborations I'd like to see where this surface work can be applied in in other contexts um would be really great yeah and it's I think I'm on, on track to figure that out I think we're good we're, we're gonna do it uh, yeah you seem to have boundless energy I'm not <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna, I've recorded this, so I'm going okay. to see it on YouTube and I'll share that with you if you'd like right. to. All right. Cool. Um, well, and and all my portraits are, if you guys Google me or if you look me up on YouTube, you can see like video of me doing the portraits. There's also like a Ted talk on there too. Um, so you can see like what I'm talking about when I talk about the idea of drawing people with a sewing machine. Well, I'll share that with them and then whatever, would you, would you prefer that I share your, like your website or? Yeah, you could share my website. The website's just michaelbirchpierce.com. Great. Right. Really I'll cool. share that, not only that video, but also your website and they'll be able to kind of, to stalk on you there. Yeah. I am really grateful that you did this. Um, and you. hopefully we have some converts to the fashion world because totally. it matters and it's yeah. exciting. And I'm, I'm very, um. I admire you, Michael. I'm really happy that you did this for me. I love you. Are you going to Miami in a couple of weeks? No, I had to turn it down. Oh, uh, that's not job. Like a, yeah. Your I job, know. the new job isn't isn't letting you do that? No, I've just had other things that I've had to do. Oh, gotcha. My best friend's getting married that weekend. So I'm like, I guess I'll be in Puerto Vallarta instead of Miami. 2024 then. We'll see you there. 2024, I'll see you there, baby. All right, promise. Okay. All right. Well, okay uh, right. I'm going to sign off and uh, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to sign off now and uh, stop recording as well. Can we still ask questions? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, more um, yeah. oh, yeah, I'll please. I don't have Sorry, any I just had more. Um, I know you're talking about how you had a class about like um, fashion and gender nonconformity and like fashion for yeah. gender nonconformity. Do you think that's going to be something we see like that gets bigger in the future? Like oh, absolutely. Yeah, I really I really hope more institutions are, are working on on um, integrating that into their curriculum specifically. I think that we've always given support to our students if they want to design things that are gender neutral. I think over the last eight years, we've I've seen at, at my school, at least, you know, a lot more gender non-conforming models. We've had drag queens model. We've had trans people model. We've had non-binary people. Now we've started, like when we do our fashion shows, just we're like, I don't know, does this look good on this body? Does this look good on that body? We'll put it on whoever it looks good on. And it doesn't matter what gendered side of the clothing, um, you know, uh, spectrum that we, that it was designed for initially. But yeah, this this course is really fun because we investigate what does it mean to be gender neutral? Um, what does it mean to be gender nonconforming? What does it mean to, to design specifically for needs that trans people have? 
Um, and so it's like, can we look at gender neutral clothes and design something that's not just like boring beige sacks, you know, like gender neutral clothes doesn't need to be black t-shirts. The Matrix part three. Right? Um, how do we design things? How do we talk to queer people and design things that they actually want? How do we design things that are just really exciting, but also kind of convert and work on different body types? How do we think about people's actual curves to their hips and the shapes of their genitals and what needs to fit into different parts of the garment? And, um, and how can we make something that accommodates all bodies? Um, and so then it starts becoming about accessibility. And uh, we start talking about like uh, ability and disability and, and uh, other aspects of, of accessibility that we need um, to let people wear our clothes. I was just, I teach a dressmaking class right now and everybody has to make a dress. And you know, they, and I'm like, we're using the same women's dress form, blah, blah, blah. It's very binary, it's very gendered. And I had a bunch of students, they all have to put pockets in these dresses. And this is even the gender non conforming class. And then I was like looking at someone's dress and I went to like put my hand in the pocket and the pocket was too small. And I said, and I like turned to the whole class and I said, this is transphobic. Why are you making these teeny tiny little pockets? Everybody should be able to fit these hands in these pockets. <laughs> like everybody needs to be able to wear this garment because you're not just designing this for yourself who's like a five foot two little, um, you know, delicate little woman. Like let's make this for like, this is a dress that anybody could wear. And um, and if we we keep that in mind, then um, then they become more accessible. So yeah, that the class is just kind of focus on those. And so it's a lot of research a lot of like presentations and paper writing and interviews with queer people to just like really understand the LGBTQ community, to understand trans and non-binary people and what we need in our clothes. Um, and then they just have the second half of the semester just design whatever the hell they want. And what's cool is that they, at the end of it, it really doesn't matter what they wear because technically all clothes, if it fits on your body, it's for, your, it's for you and your gender. So like, whatever. Um, but they have to think about like how they're going to like brand and market and label these things. Like how are they going to specifically make something that appeals to the people that they're making it for? So I think it's fun talks. I love it. It's good. Thanks. Changing yeah. the world. All right. We only have one more minute. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Much appreciated. It's in Devil Ways Father. What was that? Uh, do you have a favorite scene in Devil Wears Prada? A favorite scene? Uh, I mean, the f oh, God, what's the favorite? Favorite scene has to be when when Meryl Streep just reads her for filth and, and tells her about uh, the Cerulean sweater. The Cerulean like, belt. The collection of Cerulean gowns. Was it Oscar <laughs> de la Renta? And then it was Don Galliano, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it is great. It's my yeah. absolute favorite as well. All right, guys, I'm signing off. All right. Cheers. Bye. Take care. Michael, I'll Thank reach you. out. Thanks. Okay, cool. Love you, Melissa. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. You're welcome. Thank you, guys.